it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the, the um, annual Paul Hertelendi lecture, or PH lecture for short. Um, uh, Paul is actually um, uh, with us this, this, this evening, though he's not with us in pre in, uh, as a physical presence, which he has done many times over the years. Uh, Paul is an alumnus of the Smithsonian National Board, and he's uh, an enthusiastic poet, and he was actually dubbed a poet laureate of the Smithsonian National Board. But he, while he was um, in service on the board, he, he took an interest in, in our work at SAO, and um, that led, led him to um, introduce and endow this lecture, the PH lecture. The first lecture in this series was given in 2006 by Alexei Biklinen, and it's given annually to um, a, an astrophysicist early in her or his career um, at, 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 at the CFA. Uh, Paul lives in um, Piedmont, California, and uh, uh, it, for much of his career, he was the drama and music critic for the San Jose Mercury News. Um, before I actually get into introducing our speaker, I'd like to say that I find eclipses personally very disturbing. Um, I don't like coincidences that turn out to be pure coincidences of nature, and that there's not some underlying science behind it. And the coincidence I'm talking about is that the angular size of the moon is pretty close to the angular size of the sun, sometimes a little larger, sometimes a little smaller. And that's actually very beneficial. It's, been, it's entirely the basis of, of what, we're, what we're about to hear today, but also it played a significant role as, as I'm sure you all are aware in one of the earliest tests of, gravita of, of general, general relativity. And when the Earth-Moon system was, was, was established, the Moon was actually much closer. There were no annular eclipses. Uh, the, the, the eclipses uh, actually were, were relatively brief, but there, were much, much, uh, there was a much greater covering fraction. And furthermore, there's a limited future for eclipses. Somewhere in the 600 to 700 million year range, the Moon, which is slowly moving away from us at a few centimeters per year, will be too far away to have anything except for annular eclipses. So it's a pure coincidence that at the time humankind came into being, that we had these beautiful eclipses that made the corona available for people like uh, Jenna Samra. Uh, Jenna is um, an astrophysicist at the, at, the, at the CFA on the SAO side. She was educated at Penn State and then uh, came to Harvard to the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And she actually came to us through one of our engineers, uh, Pete Scheimetz, who she met while they were taking an, optic, an optics class at MIT. And that just led to a series of conversations and she, she was draw, drawn into um, the, the career that she's um, had at, at, um, at, at, at the CFA. And uh, that's what she's gonna be talking about today. She's talking about high altitude infrared observations of the solar corona. Jenna, you're on. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, before I start, I just wanna, I wanna thank the, uh, the, the committee and also, um, Paul Hertelendi, of course, uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture. I'm really excited about it. Um, this was my, uh, the, the first project in, in, in the program that I'm going to talk about was my PhD thesis, so it's near and dear to, to my heart. Um, and uh, I'll just point out that I was supposed to be giving this lecture from Boulder, Colorado, where we were going to be integrating onto the G5 um, airplane for our next eclipse observation. Uh, we're a bit late getting out there, so I've just put the picture in, in the background here. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you today about our um, high altitude infrared coronal instrumentation program. I'm going to start off talking about motivating the program, um, talking about magnetism in the corona and how we particularly how we might how we might measure the, the magnetic field. Um, and then I'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, AirSpec, our magnetometry pathfinder. Um, this, this, um, this was the instrument that I mentioned that um, was originally my thesis project and then um, flew again in 2019. Uh, and it's sort of the basis for everything that's, that's coming after. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, the instrument itself, the, the eclipse observations and, and the, the results that we've gotten from it. Uh, and then I'll go on to um, the outlook for our instrumentation program, um, both very, very near term, you know, next next month, uh, and and also in about the next five years. Um, so on the left here, uh, you see a picture of the the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun. 
Um, there's a lot going on in this image. You can see that it's a composite. There's a white light image um, and super, that's an eclipse image actually, um, a total eclipse. And then superimposed on that is an extreme ultraviolet image um, from, from a, a spacecraft instrument. Uh, so the fact that um, the, the, the sun or the corona is emitting in the extreme ultraviolet, those are emission lines that we see um, in the center, and also that there are free electrons that are scattering this white light at us from the photosphere, um, that gives us a clue that, that the corona is, is actually uh, very hot. And, and, and of course, we know it's, it's around a million degrees um, or above a million degrees. Uh, whereas the, the solar photosphere is, is only um, 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, so um, there are other features that we can see in the image. We can see that um, there's a lot of structure. I don't know, hopefully you can see my mouse. We see these um, long streamers, extended streamers, and, and also these um, loops here. And if we uh, zoom out, we, we get another, uh, another clue that the, the corona is not in equilibrium because it's extending so far from the surface of the sun. Uh, and in fact, if this were a live video, we could see that um, there's a dynamic event happening right here of coronal mass ejection being um, launched from, from the surface. Um, so uh, I do have a couple of videos of dynamic events in the corona. Um, so uh, on, in the middle, we have a solar flare. This is um, energy release of light as, as electromagnetic radiation. Um, and this is a particularly bright X-class flare. And then on the right, we have um, another coronal mass ejection. So this is now energy propelling plasma uh, and, and magnetic field away from the sun. Um, and of course, these can be earth effective and, and have uh, significant implications for technological societies. And so uh, it, there's, a, there's an underlying kind of the feature under, under everything I've talked about here, the, the structure of the corona, um, the dynamics, and, and the heating, and that is the coronal magnetic field. Uh, so here's another, another eclipse image. This is the 2017 eclipse um, right here in the center. Uh, this is a highly processed image, but it's, it's, it's real data um, taken from a, a ground-based team. And you can see in the processing, you can actually see the magnetic field lines um, or the plasma, uh, uh, you know, kind of tracing out the magnetic field lines here. Um, and in fact, uh, the, um, uh, on, on the left, we see a, a model of the magnetic field um, by predictive science, and we can see that it, it matches quite well. So um, just another, another indication that the, uh, the, the, the magnetic field is providing the structure here that we see um, in the corona. And um, so because it's so important, because it provides the, the, the structure and um, the, the energy for dynamic events, and also because the slow release of energy uh, is, is what, what heats the corona, although we don't exactly understand how the, um, that happens. Uh, the magnetic field is clearly, um, is clearly something we'd like to be able to measure in the corona. Uh, and that would help us predict, um, predict dynamic events like coronal mass ejections that might be earth effective. It would help us understand the heating problem. Um, it would just, it would help us uh, it would give us a, a deeper understanding of, of coronal physics if we could make these measurements to constrain our, our magnetic field models. Um, and so I'm going to talk today about um, one particular way of doing this and why it's so challenging and where we at SAO with our program fit into that. Uh, so the method I'm going to talk about is, um, is measuring emission line polarization, which can give you the line of sight magnetic field strength and the plane of sky field direction. Um, now, field strength measurements are really, really challenging. Uh, they've only been demonstrated a few times, um, and uh, they, they are challenging. You're, it's going to become apparent why they're so challenging in the next few slides, but uh, the problem is essentially that the corona um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is, uh, it, is very, very weak, um, and, and therefore it's difficult to measure. The signals that we're looking for are just are, are, are very weak. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, DKIS, the, the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope, uh, is coming online now on, um, on Maui. And two of its first light focal plane instruments will measure the magnetic field strength. Um, but they're going to do it at very high spatial resolution, but over a relatively small field of view. Um, so there's room for complementary observations here, or a complementary um, instrumentation program. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about um, at SAO today. Uh, so our, our instrumentation program 
um, is, is going to provide, it's, it's going to be differentiated from, um, from, from DKIST and, and, and other uh, observatories like that in, in three um, major ways. So first of all, it's at high altitude, which means we have reduced atmospheric scattering and, um, and reduced absorption because, again, we're looking in the infrared. And it's, it's going to be um, a large field of view as opposed to uh, a, a small high resolution field of view. And so that gets at the global corona evolution. And finally, um, from high altitude, you can make continuous long duration um, uh, observations. Uh, and, and so um, that, that gives you a, a continuous picture of, of the sun, of the corona, um, in a way that um, that a that a, um, a ground-based telescope that's subject to, to day and night cycles uh, can't can't do as well. Um, so that's where we fit in. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk quickly about coronal polarimetry because this is sort of the heart of everything um, that 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 we're eventually aiming towards, right? So. How do we actually get um, magnetic fields from the light, make remote sensing measurements using the light from the corona um, and, and get a magnetic field out of that? Well, we have to measure the, the full Stokes polarization state of the light that's coming in. Um, so these are commonly denoted as IQ UV. I is just the intensity of the line. Um, and, and this is of, of an emission line now, um, this IQ UV. So uh, Q and U are the linear polarization in the line, and V is the circular polarization. Now the circular polarization um, gives us the line of sight field strength through the Zeeman effect. That's the um, the splitting of a of a, a spectral a spectral line in the presence of a magnetic field. Um, the linear polarization gives us the plane of sky field direction um, due to the saturated Hanley effect. Uh, now the Hanley effect is actually it, the the, the um, unsaturated Hanley effect is um, a depolarization of, of emission lines that have already been polarized by resonance scattering. And um, in the presence of a magnetic field, these lines can actually become depolarized. Uh, in the case of the corona, the field strength is strong enough um, and the, uh, the, the lifetimes um, are, are, are such, the lifetimes of the, of the um, upper levels of the transitions are such that the, the Hanley effect actually doesn't give us any magnetic field strength information. Um, and all that's left is the, the angle in the plane of the sky. Um, but again, that, that comes out of the linear polarization Q and U. So uh, here, here's the, the kind of basic equations that we can use, assuming we can measure um, um, Q, U, uh, I, and, and V. And um, the, the one thing to note here is that the circular polarization, which gives us the field strength, has this K term in it. That's the, uh, the Zeeman sensitivity. Um, so the larger this term, um, the, the more sensitive measurement we can make of the same magnetic field. Uh, and, and so K goes as, um, as lambda squared. And so this is really important. This is what's driving us towards the infrared and, and driving us towards longer wavelengths. Um, so I wanna just show you an example uh, of, of what um, the Stokes, the full Stokes maps in the corona might look like. Um, since this is the basis of, of, our, of our instrumentation. Um, so, so we'll start with a, an, a kind of common sight, an EUV image of the corona. Um, this is a, a stereo image. So um, it was taken in 2014 near solar maximum. And you can see there's, uh, it, there's some active regions on both limbs. This is area, uh, areas of brighter emission here. And uh, the you know it, it's it's clear we ha we see the usual features that that the, the plasma kind of tracing out magnetic field lines here. Um, so our colleague uh, Maxim Kramer at um, University of Hawaii has has taken a, an MHD model um, from Predictive Science for for this time uh, th this 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 particular corona, and um, and he's actually modeled the full Stokes vectors. Um, using uh, this coronal line emission code um, written by, by Phil Judge and, and Roberto Cassini of, of HAO, um, the High Altitude Observatory. And so what this does is it gives us the emission in, in every, um, every element of the Stokes vector. And um, so for this particular uh, model and this particular corona, we, we get an idea of what I, Q, U, and V might look like. Uh, now there's of course no, um, magnitude information here, but this is just to sort of show you the shape, these maps down here. So um, 
we can see how the emission, and this is again, I, I didn't mention it, but this is the iron 13 um, one micron line. So an infrared, a near infrared line, quite, quite bright in the corona. Um, we can see how the emission in iron 13 in this infrared line, it, it's pretty similar to the extreme ultraviolet emission here, which is at a, a similar temperature. Um, and we can see the, the what kind of what we expect from, from Q, U, and V, and, and in particular that V is very strong, um, much stronger in the active regions than, than elsewhere in the corona. And now if we, if we just pick a pixel uh, in, in each of these um, uh, maps, and we plot it, these are, these, the, the maps down here are integrated over wavelength, but now if we plot the wavelength profiles, um, we, see, we see that, we see the problem with making these measurements, right? We have um, a, the, the intensity of the emission line, which is um, in, in spectral radiance, the peak is around 15 times 10 to the um, 13 photons per second per centimeter squared to radian nanometer. Um, we see that Q and U are about uh, 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 two orders of magnitude down from that. And, and we see that V is about, which gives us the, the, the field strength again, the site field strength um, is about four orders of magnitude um, uh, weaker than the emission line. And so this is what makes these measurements so challenging. Um, and, uh, and, and that's gonna come into play when I, when I talk, especially towards the end of the talk, when we actually talk about designing an instrument to, to measure the magnetic field. Um, but first I'd like to talk about the lines. Uh, what lines are we actually looking at to, to make these, these polarization measurements? Well, they're all magnetic dipole transitions. Um, because the corona is so hot, uh, the, the, um, the electric dipole transitions have, um, have, have much shorter wavelengths in, in uh, for instance, the extreme ultraviolet. Um, so the infrared transitions that we're that we're looking for are in the um, our magnetic dipole transitions. And I have an example here from um, a, a paper published by um, Benjamin Bo and, and Shadia Habal. This is a, another 2017 eclipse paper. Um, they had these narrow band um, imagers, which um, they they observed the corona with during the eclipse. And so these were in um, two lines, a, a, a green and a, a red or near infrared line, um, two, two um, ionization states of, of iron. Um, and you can see the different structures at different temperatures and kind of the, um, the, 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 the power of having two different lines here to, to observe the corona. And so of course, um, if you're just looking at line intensity uh, in these lines, we can get um, plasma temperature from, from line ratios and other, and other metrics. Um, we can get uh, density from line ratios, and we can get um, line of sight and, and plane of sky velocity um, just from the intensity in the lines. And, and as I mentioned before, um, the line polarization provides the magnetic field. So you have to, uh, the Zeeman splitting isn't, isn't large enough to, to view without, um, without, to measure without viewing the, the polarization and, and not just the intensity. Uh, so the, um, the, the key here is that th this is a, 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 an example with visible lines because it's the same physics to produce these, these two lines. Um, but we're not looking in the visible. We are looking um, in the infrared because we want, we want that, that, that Zeeman splitting um, boost from, from you know, lambda squared uh, in the infrared while thermal broadening in these very hot coronal lines is only going as lambda. And so um, here's the lines that, that, that we're targeting. Uh, so the, these were all predicted, the, the intensities were first predicted by Phil Judge in his 1998 paper. And I, I've shown a plot here and the, the, the lines that we are, um, have either targeted in the past or are planning to target uh, are marked with the arrows. Um, so our eclipse missions targeted six lines, um, the, the, the ones shown here of various temperatures and um, wavelengths between um, about 1.4 and four microns. And our balloon measurement, our balloon instrument, um, which I'll talk about at the end, uh, is, is targeting two of our eclipse lines that, that were shown to be the most promising. And also um, the, uh, the iron 13 line and um, a natural a line pair in iron 13 that I, I mentioned on the previous slide. And these have been um, well, well observed. So we, we understand what to, what to expect from them, we think. Um, so these are, this is the, uh, this is the region of the infrared and, and the kind of emission lines that we're looking at. Um, 
And um, that kind of leads me into uh, talking about our, our instrumentation to, to make these measurements. So um, I, I moved, I started off by, by motivating the magnetic field measurements, but then moved into talking about emission lines. Well, that's because uh, our, our first set of instruments doesn't actually measure magnetic fields. They don't measure polarization. They just measure um, the, the line intensities. Uh, so our first, um, our first instrument was, uh, was called AirSpec. The program began in, in 2015 when we were funded by the NSF on a major research instrumentation grant to build um, AirSpec, the Airborne Infrared Spectrometer, and fly it in the 2017 um, total eclipse. In, uh, in 2019, um, we flew AirSpec again. It, it flies on the Gulfstream 5. Um, we, we made a number of improvements and we observed the, um, the eclipse that was over the South Pacific in that year. Um, in 2020, the end of 2020, very soon, uh, we are planning to observe another eclipse, but this time um, we, we've had another um, MRI grant from the NSF to change the instrument in some sense. And what we've done is we've, um, we've changed the, 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 the solar tracking platform. Um, uh, we've decoupled it from the instrument and um, we've made a larger aperture. Uh, and so the idea is to, um, to commission this new platform um, with our observation of the 2020 eclipse. And because we have the platform now, we were able to add a focal plane instrument um, because the, the, the solar tracking platform was no longer part of our instrument. So I'll talk about that, that's coming up. And um, in the 2024 eclipse across North America, we, um, we wanna refly the, the front end of the platform, the solar tracking part with a new focal plane instrument. Um, we'd like to fly a, a Fourier transform spectrometer. Um, so after that, we are moving to higher altitude. Um, we're moving away from, from, from eclipses, which are wonderful, but uh, not long duration by any stretch of the imagination. So we're moving to um, a balloon-based a balloon coronagraph. Um, so uh, we call this instrument Corsair, and uh, the plan right now, um, this has just been proposed to NASA, is a, a demonstration flight in 2024, a one-day flight, and then a two-week Antarctic flight um, where we can actually get global long-duration continuous measurements of the magnetic field um, in, uh, in December 2026. So this is the overview of our program. I'm going to spend most of, uh, most of the time talking about the two airspec missions because those are the ones that have uh, happen successfully, and um, and then I'll uh, I'll go into some details on the other of the future projects. Um, so, AirSpec, the Airborne Infrared Spectrometer. Um, its primary goal, again, it can't measure magnetic fields. Its primary goal is to characterize the IR emission lines um, that we would use to measure magnetic field to inform our our future instrumentation development. Uh, so, this is a picture of of AirSpec as it was in 2017. It's a really, um, it's a complicated instrument. There's a lot going on here. Um, because it's mounted on the airplane, it has a, an image stabilizing mirror here. This is electronically controlled. Um, the, uh, the, the bench that it's mounted on is isolated from vibration and it's um, translatable uh, um, forward and back and left and right so that you can catch the sun as it comes through this small window um, and you have this kind of soda straw problem uh, where you, um, as, as the sun changes angle, the beam actually moves where it hits on the bench. Um, so uh, the actual instrument itself is, uh, is a telescope um, which focuses light onto, onto two uh, cameras. There's a, a in, in um, AirSpec, we just had a, a context camera, white light context camera, which helped us do our tracking and, and our pointing. Um, um, most of the light went to that camera a little bit of the light went into uh, went through the the entrance slit of the spectrometer and into um, our infrared spectrometer, and um, it's a, a pretty standard um, reflective IR spectrometer uh, with a a, a a planar grating and um, spherical focus mirrors and spherical collimator. Um, the the tricky part here was that we had to fit. A, a, a lot of we wanted to survey a lot of uh, emission lines that were kind of far apart in wavelength, and so we we did some tricks with um, with with the light to um, to get them all into the, the same place on the detector. And so this is the de the detector layout. It's actually measuring in, in two channels, and we use two orders of the grating 
um, to try to get all of these these lines between one and four microns um, in, in the same place in, a, in limited real estate on the detector. Um, so uh, I want to talk just quickly about the airborne platform. We couldn't we couldn't um, make these observations without the NSF Goldstream Five. It's operated by the National Center for Atmospheric Research and CAR. Um, it's got about a fifty thousand foot ceiling, uh, which is a bit higher than commercial. Uh, and um, it's it's uh, it's a it's a Goldstream Five. So it's typically a, a corporate jet. Um, that's what it would often be used for this plane. But this one. Uh, they have they have outfitted it with special viewports. So um, we at, for airspec we look out of a a small nine by six inch sapphire viewport um, that we can move to various places uh, depending on the angle of the sun. So um, we have it in a different location for each of the eclipses that we're planning to observe. So there's a picture of the the Gulf Stream in Lima um, during the last eclipse observation. Here's another picture. The next, uh, the, the 2019 um, incarnation of airspec on the Gulfstream 5. You can see that we had to fly liquid nitrogen. Um, I'll talk about how long that uh, that 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 trip was and why we why we needed to do that. Um, and finally, just a quick picture of installing airspec. You know, this uh, this bench has to be broken into um, pieces so that we can actually get it on the plane and around the bend. Um, so this was a real, this was an engineering feat, um, and the, the lead engineer on um, on these missions is, is Vanessa Marquez at, at SAO. Uh, so image stabilization was a really important um, uh, part of, of what we learned how to do on, on airspec. Um, uh, it's the, the, you know, the airplane, it's a smooth flight up there, but um, when you're looking over such a small field of view, um, if we had no stabilization, we wouldn't be able to actually um, to, to get an image. Um, we wouldn't be able to stay pointed in, in one place on the sun. Uh, so this is our um, this is these are some some movies of the solar photosphere during some test flights. The dark line in the center is the entrance slit to our spectrometer. So all the light gets through that gets through there is our um, is our scientifically useful light, and um, and the the context images tell us where we're where we're pointing. Um, in 2017, uh, we didn't actually use these images to, to do any kind of um, tracking. So we didn't, we didn't try to um, find the edge and track uh, because we couldn't test that ahead of time on an eclipse. And we wanted to make sure that there were no surprises when we, um, when we after doing months of test flights, when we flew the eclipse flight, we wanted it to operate just the same way. Uh, so we used a gyroscope to, um, to figure out what the plane was doing and to, to figure out how to move our mirror to compensate for that. Um, now in 2019, we added, um, we added feedback tracking on the image and you can see that it, it, it made the, obser the, um, the observations much more, much more stable. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show some more quantitative um, uh, information on that a little later. Um, so Airspec observed two, uh, two eclipses so far. In 2017, we observed the U.S. eclipse uh, over Kentucky. We were based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was a pretty quick um, few-hour flight, uh, which was just a warm-up for the um, the marathon flight we took in 2019, where we um, we were based in Lima, Peru. Uh, the eclipse did cross land or, or totality cross land um, in Chile and Argentina, but th it was quite short there. It was a um, close to sunset. And um, we observed at local noon where we got a much longer eclipse, but we had to be over um, the middle of the Pacific, uh, more than 2,000 miles from land. So, um, so we, we, we made plans and, and uh, the, the, uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research really um, helped us uh, uh, basically ach achieve this, this observation. Um, so the plan was that we would take off from Lima, Peru. Um, we'd fly six hours out to the observation point, filling with liquid nitrogen all the way um, to keep our, our instrument uh, nice and cold and get it to equilibrium. And um, then at that point, we'd observe the eclipse. Um, and when it was over, we um, we we would land in um, on Rapa Nui in Easter Island uh, and and spend a day there because um, for crew rest issues and. Uh, and and also because um, we didn't we didn't want to um, we we either couldn't or it would have really limited our ceiling to carry enough fuel to get back to Lima, Peru. 
Um, so we actually we actually got a trip to, to Easter Island in 2019. Um, so this uh, this was a logistically really complex eclipse, and the fact that it went off is, is a testament to oh the the um, the, the people at at NCAR. Um, so I want to give you a flavor of what it's like in the airplane um, because these observations are terrifying. Uh, it's hard to describe, um, but uh, basically we have four operators on the plane. Um, I'm I'm pointing the the um, to different places in the corona. Uh, in the previous um, observations, Ed DeLuca, who was the PI of those two missions, was um, was looking at the quick look science data. Um, and um, we had uh, uh, Vanessa Marquez, uh, who I mentioned, she was um, dealing with the cryogens and, and moving the, the bench as, as necessary to catch the sun. And then Peter Scheimetz, um was 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 talking to the pilots uh, and making sure that we were we were coming into the path um, at the right you know at the right time and the right angle and the right location so that we would actually be um, be in the shadow when we needed to be. So there are a lot of moving parts to this. It was um, it was really challenging. And uh, one of the one of the questions that we had on the 2019 eclipse was, you know, would the image tracking work um, because we still hadn't ever tested it on an eclipse? Um, and so this is this is the moment when we when we try to start that. Okay, so um, so we were very happy because uh, we were able to um, to to get the sun to to snap to the center of the screen, and uh, that meant that our, our our tracking was going to work. Um, and we um, we we did the rest of of the observation, moving to different positions. This was just the first one of of um, of five or six uh, in in the corona on on um on both the the east and west limbs of the sun. Um, and so the uh, this is the now we go back to the 2017 observation. Um, these are the the slip positions on the on the right here um, where we where we spent the, most of our time. Uh, the uh, I show the map on the left just because it was um, just to just to kind of emphasize the, the 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 sheer panic that it was as we were coming into the um, into the path here and then. Uh, had to do all these calibrations and and lost the pointing and got the pointing back and didn't know what we were gonna um, be doing at the time that you know the shadow passed over us and uh, it, you're kind of on this train that you can't get off at that point um, and and finally um, you know we we were pointed at the sun everything was okay the shadow um, the totality passed us uh, or 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 went overhead. Um, but uh, we couldn't see anything in our quick look data. So um, it turned out that we got really nice results from this eclipse and I'll show them in a little bit. But um, this kind of half hour stretch here is, uh, it, it can be pretty terrifying. And so in the, um, the 2019 eclipse, we had um, a more, more mature, we had a longer eclipse, but we also had a more mature operations plan. And so, um, and a more mature instrument. And so it was a, a little bit, a little bit calmer. Um, and we got uh, we got a really long eclipse. We had a tailwind, and so we we saw nine minutes of totality, and we got data for for seven minutes. We actually did lose the pointing in the center, but um, we were able to get it back. So we had an, a, a short intermission. Um, so in, in 2019, we spent most of our time. It was a very quiet corona. Um, it, it was really close to solar minimum, if not solar minimum. Um, so we spent most of our time where, where the emission would be brightest on the east and west limbs. Um, so we, we have, um, uh, I'm going to show some data in particular from this position five on the east limb in, in a little bit. Um, I want to talk quickly about the improvements that we made. Uh, one of the major improvements to um, the instrument in 2019 versus 2017 was reducing the thermal background to get, um, to get these high sensitivity measurements. Uh, so this was a collaborative effort with the camera manufacturer. They had to basically redesign um, their, their their infrared camera uh, so that um, it, we, it, things would be kind of cold and, and dark enough and there were no light leaks uh, for us to get the long exposure times that we needed. Um, in order to do this, we, we actually cut off um, our, our four micron line to reduce the thermal emission um, that, that comes uh, between three and four microns. Um, 
so so that was a that was a loss, but uh, but but well worth it for the the observations that we got. Um, we also had a, a much much reduced background structure. So the the um, the spectra, which which you'll see um, in in a couple of slides, were just much easier to to process in in twenty in twenty nineteen. Um, and then the other major improvement was to the to the stability. So I showed you the movies, but um, after after co-aligning uh, the observations along the slit, uh, this is this is kind of the if we look at um, any one um, pointing. Uh, and then plot out all of the slip positions. Uh, you can see that the jitter was much worse in in 2017. It couldn't be co-aligned, um, whereas in the, uh, across the slit here, uh, in 2019, um, it, it was it was it was much much better. And so um, the the, the co-alignment along the slit actually um, basically gave us um, positions that were. We, we stayed pointed at, at one spot in the corona. In, in 2017, we couldn't say much about the precise location where we were pointed because because of the jitter. Um, so this was this is now something that we're building on in our um, Aspire image stabilization system. Uh, and we also um, removed a couple of artifacts, which I which I I am not going to go into, but um, it was a much better instrument in 2019. Um, so. Uh, here's an example of our spectra. This is what the 2019 spectra look like. We have, uh, I mentioned we have two channels. The, um, the, um, the left hand uh, short wavelength channel here actually has um, overlap. It has uh, light coming from three microns and uh, around 1.4 microns. It's using two orders on the, on the grading. And, um, and then we have this, this longer wavelength channel here. And these channels were selected to, to capture as many um, lines in a small amount of, of space as, as possible. Um, so uh, in, in 2019, AirSpec measured four lines. Um, so the, these two were, uh, were first detected by AirSpec. They're absorbed, fully absorbed from the ground. And um, so they're not, they're, not, they're not possible to see. Um, and uh, the 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 iron nine line here we actually um, detected in 2017 we were pretty sure but uh, we needed the more sensitive observation to to um, be certain uh, and then th this line here the sulfur 11 line is actually part of a density sensitive line pair um, so this allows us to do a remote sensing measurement of density in the corona and we adjusted our passband to get this line for for this reason um, so uh, I'm going to show some density measurements in, in a little bit. Um, now, fitting the spectra, uh, you can see there's a lot of atmospheric absorption in them. We needed an atmospheric model to, um, to take that into account. Um, and uh, we basically kind of lumped everything into a, um, into a model here uh, to get the fits that we got. So, you know, it's the, the atmospheric spectrum, it's the, the solar continuum, um, the coronal continuum of scattered light, um, the instrument line shape, and then, of course, the, the emission lines themselves. Uh, and and once you do that, you can get um, quite a nice fit, uh, as shown in the in the colors here. Um, and uh, so so doing kind of a, a careful job here allows us to get the really accurate intensities, line intensities that we need to do um, to do density and and eventually temperature measurements. Um, and so uh, so now I'll, I'll talk. Uh, I'll just give an overview of kind of the science results that we can get out of out of AirSpec itself, even though it can't measure magnetic fields. Um, so uh, one thing we can do is we can um, measure the atomic processes in the in the lines. So in the excitation processes, um, the extreme ultraviolet lines are 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 arise from from collisions in the corona, um, whereas the the visible lines and the infrared lines um, have contributions from um, from resonance scattering because of the, um, the 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 light in the underlying photosphere. And so um, one thing we can do is just look at the fall off. This was something we did early on in 2017, and uh, and compare um, you know the the um, the fall off as you go away from the limb of the sun uh, to to something like um, AIA, um, an extreme ultraviolet imager, and and we see that um, in fact uh, the the IR lines fall off more slowly, which means um, first of all it confirms that. That, that radiation is important for exciting them. Um, but the second thing is that it means that they're gonna be a more sensitive diagnostic further from the limb than the EUV lines. So that's gonna be powerful um, in, in, in the future. 
Uh, and here um, we actually could do a more quantitative uh, assessment by, by doing an absolute radiometric calibration. And we find that um, this is a graph from a, a paper that, that Chad Madsen published uh, in 2019. We find that uh, in fact, um, the, the models um, are, are we, we can differentiate between models uh, using our, our, our airspec data, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, so the model data here comes from, from Giulio, De, Giulio Delzana at, um, at University of Cambridge. Um, so we have density diagnostics. Uh, we have a density sensitive line pair, as I mentioned, in the infrared. Um, so there's a couple of, you have to do some, uh, some extra steps to, to, to deal with um, doing a density measurement in the infrared versus the, the, more, the more commonly um, used extreme ultraviolet in the corona. Um, so the first thing is you have to do a careful job, as I mentioned, fitting the lines, including the atmospheric absorption, get um, very precise intensities. Uh, then I, I, um, I was able to uh, improve the, the fits here um, by, by ratioing with the continuum, um, because again, there, there's light everywhere, the scattered light coming from the coronal continuum. And so you can actually take out some of the, um, the, the error in your calibration by, by using the continuum. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the light that's, because of the, the contributions from radiation, and because I mentioned that these lines fall off um, much, much less quickly than the EUV lines, um, when you're looking at a, um, a, a, a region of the corona, you're actually looking at emission from uh, all along the line of sight. And so to, to use the typical density, um, density sensitive uh, ratios, you actually need to, to, to use a, a model to remove the contributions that are outside the plane of the sky. And so again, we use Julia Dozana's model here. Um, it reproduces the intensities very nicely um, from the, the air spec lines. And then um, uh, the, um, the, the density that's retrieved is, is also, um, is also a, a good match. And, and in fact, also matches a totally independent eclipse um, density uh, measurement from from the high altitude observatory. They observed the uh, the the the, uh, the, eclipse, the eclipse in in Chile in 2019. Um, so this work is ongoing and and it's looking promising. Um, so these are just some some early results. Um, even earlier, uh, I just wanted to point out that we do have some temperature sensitivity in these lines. Um, the the, uh, the the lines shown here i'm just i'm just trying to highlight that in different regions of the corona um, we see that our our hotter line is is either stronger or weaker compared to um, to one of our cooler lines and it turns out that those appear to to sort of coincide if you look at uh, aia data with with where we would expect um, a hotter or cooler plasma from the the different temperature channels of aia so i think that um, when we continue to do to do some temperature analysis uh, we're gonna we're gonna get some nice results here as well. Um, and finally, in 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 2017, we did do uh, uh, we tried to look at um, measuring coronal temperature with air spec. We had kind of limited data, uh, but we did have um, coordinated observations from the extreme ultraviolet imaging spectrometer. And so um, my colleague Chad Madsen did a, a had a, a really nice um, uh, a, a really nice paper here that. Uh, he was able to make these beautiful, now these are extreme ultraviolet, not infrared, um, but density and temperature maps of the, um, the 2017 uh, eclipse corona. And so, um, so of course, this is a, a more mature uh, processing than, than, than doing it in the infrared, but um, the, uh, the, there's, clearly, there's clearly much to be learned here um, with coordinated observations. So infrared observations get you um, higher sensitivity, further from the LIN. Uh, extreme ultraviolet observations um, can be easier to, to interpret in some in some cases because of uh, because they're only collisionally excited. Um, and so um, we've taken uh, ICE co-observed with us again in 2019, and we're planning to co-observe with them um, in 2020. And so we're gonna we're gonna keep we're gonna keep doing this kind of um, this kind of analysis where we look at um, a coordination between the IR and EUV observations and, and what we can learn about, about the plasma itself. Um, and uh, in, in um, okay, so I guess uh, the, I'll, I'll go on to our, our, our future plans. Um, so our, 
our Aspire platform, which I mentioned, is our, our platform for future eclipses. Uh, it's called the Airborne Stabilized Platform for Infrared Experiments. And so this is, um, this is a picture of the bench in the lab I just took a, a couple days ago. Uh, it's, all, it's all assembled, um, ready, almost ready to ship to Colorado. Uh, we've replaced our, our, our steering mirror with this really large aperture mirror that provides a, a 20 centimeter diameter beam. Um, and so that's, that's, that's critical for, um, for allowing high sensitivity measurements. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, the, the, the framework here is that um, the other thing that we've done with Aspire, or one of the other things that we've done, is that we've basically separated out the image stabilization platform. Um, we call it a platform, but uh, um, it's really this, this, this mirror, this kind of front end for the instrument. Um, so now we have a dedicated camera that looks at the mirror. And, um, and does the tracking for us. And that frees up um, uh, our, our focal plane instruments to, um, to, for, for us to have more focal plane instruments or to gather more light with our focal plane instruments. Um, so in Aspire, we're reflying air spec. There's the same spectrometer. Um, we've, we've, up, we've replaced the telescope with a, a slightly larger aperture. Uh, and we've added now a, um, a, a an infrared narrowband imager, so that we can actually make some of these um, these these uh, maps of different emission lines at different temperatures in the corona in two dimensions. Um, now the the goal is to um, to refly um, uh, this half of the instrument and then to replace the the, the focal plane instruments. So Aspire is really the, the platform here. Um, so uh, in the 2020 eclipse. Um, we're going to be observing just off the coast of Chile, uh, and um, we're going to be based in Puerto Montt, and um, we expect about a, a three-minute a three minute eclipse, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the wind. Um, I mentioned that because we've, we've got this, this new platform that's doing our stabilization kind of independently, we can now, um, this is that same image from, from Benjamin Bow, uh, the 2017 eclipse image. I just Put it here because uh, it's a it's this is the field of view that we'll get with our um, our camera, and uh, it, we're going to be also looking at two different temperatures, um, a, about ten to the six point three and and ten to the um, ten to the six point one um, uh, Kelvin, and so um, this means that we don't we this gives us context basically sci scientifically useful data. Um, that also gives us context for um, where we are in the corona, uh, because this right here is the the slit, the entrance to our spectrometer. Um, but now we actually will we'll actually have a, a 2D measure of these emission lines. Um, and finally, uh, Aspire, um, because of the larger aperture, it provides um, a improved sensitivity even in in air spec, um, the the same old air spec spectrometer, um, somewhat. Uh, and and of course with um, with with a different telescope or by changing changing the optics, we could we could we could do even better. Um, but instead, uh, we're gonna actually fly a whole new focal plane instrument in the future. Um, we're gonna uh, retire our spec for the for the time being um, because what we want to do next is um, is look for it, we want to survey the infrared corona and and look for new lines that are that are that have diagnostic potential. Um, so uh, Aspire enables the, the throughput and the altitude for this, right? We want to be at high altitude because we want to see, is there anything there that maybe hasn't been predicted um, and, um, or, or maybe is, is, has been predicted but is much brighter than, than, than we think that really could be a kind of a, um, a really important line for measuring the magnetic field um, with, with high altitude instrumentation. And so the eclipse flight is kind of the, the perfect um, the perfect place to do this because you, you don't need a long time to just um, kind of characterize the lines to see if it's there or not and where in the corona it's brighter or, or dimmer or weaker. Um, but you do need a, a, a large aperture for, for this type of instrument. And so now we, we have that. Um, and um, you do need a large spectral range uh, and you need it to be continuous unlike air spec. Um, and so that's why we're going for a, a Fourier transform spectrometer. 
So this is going to be another MRI proposal that we submit to the NSF in January. Um, and right now, it's not entirely um, fleshed out, but we're thinking that we, we one, one option is to buy a commercial Fourier transform spectrometer, um, put a 2D detector on it, put imaging optics on it, uh, at relatively low resolution. And um, also, uh, probably we're going to need to add cryogenic cooling to it. Um, it alternately, we, alternatively, we could, we could build something um, from scratch and in, in-house. So we're still we're still thinking through through those options. Um, and the proposals due um, in the end of January. Um, so after uh, the 2024 eclipse, we are um, we're moving away from eclipses. Uh, we've just proposed for a balloon born coronagraph um, from for for uh, this is a NASA proposal that we put in um, earlier this month. Uh, this is this instrument is called Corsair. And the coronal spectropolarimeter for airborne infrared research. So this instrument actually makes the um, the, the measurements of the, the full Stokes vector uh, that I that I motivated the whole talk with um, way back uh, 40 minutes ago. Um, so this this is actually going to measure magnetic field. Um, now here's a, a a model of the um, of the instrument inside the uh, the truss structure that mounts to the balloon gondola. Um, the the plan for us is to do a um, a one day commissioning flight in September 2024. We would do that in the U.S. and then um, in uh, 2026 we could um, launch from Antarctica, get into the the, the polar vortex there, and um, we're hoping or we believe that we can we can be up for um, aloft for 10 days to two weeks, uh, which which is a, a really um, wonderful test case for these these long duration um, global measurements of, of the, the coronal magnetic field. Um, so this is this is a pathfinder for space. Uh, now Corsair, I'm going to go into a little bit on the instrument, but it, it measures five infrared lines. Um, so we can do all of the, the plasma measurements just with the intensities, um, density, temperature, velocity. Uh, and then because it measures polarization, we can get our magnetic field measurements. So um, this is what the Corsair um, data looks like. It's uh, it's a multi-slit spectrometer. So in order to um, to get uh, spatial coverage without uh, the slow process of rastering the slit, we have um, we have many slits uh, which are um, which each which each give us a a, a measure of, of an emission line in that particular location of the corona. So we're sort of we've got a, a spectral spatial mixing here, but um, we've spaced them so that there's no overlap um, be between slits or, or, or minimal. Um, so the, the instrument itself is, is pretty complex. Um, the, the trick here was that we had these five uh, target lines that were um, over, again, a long wavelength range. And so in order to, to measure them with, with similar sensitivity, um, of course, your grading is, is your diffraction grading is very, um, dependent on, on wavelength, the efficiency of it. Um, so in order to measure these five lines with similar sensitivity and also similar um, resolving power, uh, we, we use the grading in multiple orders. Um, we also designed a polarimeter that would have high efficiency um, in, in, in multiple orders at just our particular five wavelengths. Uh, so the polarimeter is um, a, a linear polarizer and a rotating wave plate. Um, the spectrometer is a, this is the, the grading here, and these are just lenses. Um, and then we have um, uh, a, an, an infrared camera um, that'll be right here. Um, now, the, uh, the, the coronagraph itself, which feeds the whole instrument, is, um, is a lens uh, that, that reduces the, the instrumental scatter compared to using a mirror. Um, so this is a, um, a meniscus lens out here made of zinc selenide. Uh, it focuses down onto an occulter, which is, which is right here. Um, and um, the, the engineering on this one is, I, I just want to <laughs> show this just to, sh just to show kind of how, how um, complicated a, an engineering project this was as well. Um, so there are a lot of mechanisms. Because we're, um, we're working with refractive optics now, uh, the, um, the lenses all have to move when we go from one line to another. Um, we have to dump the heat from the, um, the, the, 
the disk of the sun, uh, we have to um, actually roll the whole instrument because the pointing system on the balloon only is, is an azimuth elevation pointing system. And so over the course of the day, the, the solar image rolls. So we have to take that out. Um, and of course, we just have the, uh, the, you know, the challenges of mounting um, this kind of structure, heavy, uh, large structure to, to the balloon gondola. Um, uh, but so I wanted to end on this because because we did kind of a careful job modeling um, what we expected to see from Corsair uh, for the proposal, and I think it it came out pretty pretty nicely. And and I wanted to I wanted to share this. So if you remember back um, a few a few slides ago at the beginning, I showed these um, these pictures uh, of of Stokes IQ UNV, and um, they were kind of idealized. Uh, so now if we if we take those maps and we run them through our instrument. Um, so they're distorted, and then we um, kind of re, you know, do some geometric correction to get rid of the distortion, and then we add noise, um, and then we actually try to retrieve the magnetic field uh, using the equations that I showed in that earlier slide. Uh, these are the results that we get. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, a couple things to see here. We have we have two emission lines um, that that I'm showing. And and they give really complementary information. Um, the uh, the iron the iron line down here is a, a much brighter line and gives better information um, on on velocities and and the plane of sky angle. Um, but that that high um, Zeeman sensitivity of the of the long wavelength silicon line. This is a, a four micron line, whereas this is a one micron line. Um, Really gives you a, um, a a precise measurement of the um, of the the line of sight magnetic field. Uh, it, it that's what we expect at least um, in these simulations, and and the two lines because they're different temperatures. There you can see they're also kind of probing different coronal structures if if you look carefully at this. Um, and so uh, so this this was pretty exciting to see that in a, in a, in an hour. Um, we could get a, um, a a pretty precise measurement of of the magnetic field in this active region over here um, using our our coarse air balloon. Uh, and and so on the on the right here, I've just this is just the un, the uncertainty in the measurements, and you can see that um, in the active region it, it, it's quite low. In the one hour measurement, it's just on the order of a, of a few gauss. Um, so I. Uh, I, I, that's all I have to say about, um, about our program, but um, I want to thank you again for the opportunity and um, I have to thank a lot of people who, uh, who, who have been involved in, in one or, or, or many of these projects um, and their, their names are here um, and, uh, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Charlie, I think Randall. I think you're going to have to field the questions. I'm. I'm okay. Um, I'm not seeing the hands raised at this point. I, uh, Joy, if you would like to unmute, please feel free to ask. Oh, I didn't have a question. Okay. All right. Why, why don't I just uh, start out? Actually, I see Tony um, has raised his hand, but now. Uh, I, I just wondered if is is what's the technical limitation that limits how far you go to the infrared because you've got that lambda squared dependence so that would suggest that you should be going as far to the infrared to, yes. to the as you can. Um, that's a good question. It's not a technical limitation. Uh, it's uh, maybe I can um, find a, a slide that uh, that shows this, but it turns out that the line strength, um, the lambda squared, only gets you so far. The line strength is um, gets weaker as you go further into the infrared, and so um, there's only so much um, that the Zeeman sensitivity can do to make up for that. So if I go back to my uh, this this spectrum right here, um, this is on a log scale, but uh, you can see that that as you go further out, generally um, the, the the line the line strength falls off, and the, that four micron line is sort of a rarity. Because it's strong for where it is, um, it, and it also has the long wavelength. So that that is a line that we're really excited about. That's been um, pretty seldom measured right now. Um, we've probably made the best measurement of it with Airspec, uh, Airspec 2017, and certainly um, 
uh, hasn't been been measured in, in polarization, uh, well, although D it is a decoast line. Um, so we're really excited about about having that target line in our balloon. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Tony, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering why the uh, Corsair flights are are only expected to be two weeks. I mean that. Uh, long duration ballooning from McMurdo uh, nowadays, you can get 80 day uh, flights. Uh, is is it because it's it's too heavy for a overpressure balloon, or what's what's the story there? Oh, that's a so that's a good question. I think that um, two weeks was um, was what we needed to 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 satisfy our science goals, and so um, or, or 10 days or so. Uh, so that was sort of the minimum, and I think that we actually don't know exactly what to expect from um, from those flights. So uh, we we focused the proposal that we put in was just for the one day flight in the U.S. Um, and so we didn't discuss much what the options were for ballooning um, or, or what what balloons we would be compatible with. Uh, if we could get 80 days, that would that would be amazing. Uh, so, um, so I think we're going to have to have further conversations with with NASA about that, and it, it could just be that that we're not aware. Um, but um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, Jenna, if I can ask a question, sure. I think you mentioned at one point uh, that you were thinking of going into space or preparing for space. Um, what would you? Uh, what kind of mission would you be looking at? Would you be looking at a small sat or a larger larger facility? Um, I think eventually a, a larger facility. It would be nice if we could do this in a small sat. Um, I'm not sure because these these instruments are have all been so so large right now. I'm not sure it's going to fit in the form factor. Um, but but we haven't explored it very um, at all really yet. Uh, so it's and I'm also not too familiar with you know what the restrictions are on small sat. Um, so I think we would try for that. That certainly seems like the next step if if you could uh, after the balloon. But um, but um, if if that wasn't possible, then you know potentially more balloon missions to to get us to a higher TRL level um, to do a larger a larger space mission. And Bill, hi Jenna, this is Bill Foreman. When you showed your observational spectrum and then you showed your fit, it looked mm -hmm. like there were other features in the fit that appeared. Yeah, there was um. Are those, are those real? Let's see if I can go back to where it was. Um, so it's the end of the slide. Yeah. So are you talking about? Um, well, you show the, the 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 red the red one, for example, shows all kinds of features. So um, you mean here? For or, example, yes. So those are those are real, right? They're also in the data. Um, because that's the atmospheric absorption, these particular lines. Um, now, where it doesn't quite agree, you know, maybe right here, uh, that could be, um, you know, something that's either not captured by our model, um, by our atmospheric model. Um, the slower, uh, or and and this as well looks. It looks like um, this, this absorption band right here. It looks like a similar one here, and and clearly the model doesn't capture that. Um, the uh, the slower variations, like maybe this this right here, how that doesn't quite match up, I, that might be due to our um, our radiometric calibration. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised um, if that that was a bit off. Uh, but the higher frequency things, or higher higher you know um, the, the the more structured things here are probably absorption lines that just isn't captured in our model. And we can do a better job and with a better atmospheric model. Um, this the goal here was to get to get the model um, kind of right on near the emission lines, and we weren't so worried about further away. Uh, but but I think there's there's more work to be done there. Does that answer your question? I don't. So, yeah, sort of. So just short of 1.94, there's an emission, and then there, you know there's an up. Yeah. 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 So are those new things, or those are just imperfect modeling, Im Im just imperfect modeling of what you already know? So they're not new solar things. I think this is an atmospheric feature, whatever okay. it is, um, or it's an instrument feature. But my guess is it's an atmospheric feature, uh, and it's possible that it's not even a new, that it's known a, a, a known atmospheric um, structure, but that the model that I'm using is just a little too simplistic um, to capture it. So I'd have to I'd have to do a little more digging uh, into into better models, maybe. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, sure. So Jenna, when you get Coursera, are you going to give up uh, chasing eclipses? Yeah, I'd be happy to ch give up chasing eclipses and actually stand on the ground and look at an eclipse for a change and, and be able to stare at it for more than five seconds. So um, <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, I think the goal, uh, um, more seriously, the eclipses were never uh, um, going to be the, the main event here. They were always a stepping stone to, to something, to something um, more long, long, long term. Um, although the, the moon is a really wonderful occulter, uh, it, it, because it's outside Earth's atmosphere and outside your instrument, um, I think just having the ability to make these um, continuous long duration measurements, you, you, can, you can make up for with exposure time or integration time, which you, which you don't have um, with, with scattering. Yeah, okay. Well, Randall, I think, the, I think we're done with the questions. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, for hands are all set. Well, we'd love to clap you, um, <laughs> uh, give you a, a rousing uh, uh, round of applause. But thank you very much, Jenna. Um, yeah. This is a very, very interesting piece of work. Um, thank you. And good luck. Good luck next month. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll let you know. Everybody yeah. will hear, I'm sure.